The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph over the other side. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. I gotta get back to work. The Avro Lancaster, one of the most iconic British aircraft of the Second World War. People always celebrate the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but let's not forget the Lancaster is surely just as iconic. My great uncle flew in them in World War II, in the latter part of World War II. I get weepy every time I get within 100 feet of a Lancaster bomber, and I get massively excited every time I see one in a fly path. What started out as a deadly design... The Manchester was killing crews. ..turned into a pilot's dream. They called it from a beast to a beauty, because the Lancaster was a beauty. The Lancaster's unique capabilities helped change the course of the war in Europe. It plays an extremely important part in winning the Second World War. This is the story of the Avro Lancaster and of the war factory that built it. Nineteen thirty six. As Hitler's Nazi Germany turns its factories to military production, Britain prepares for war. There was uh, very much uh, a possibility of war in Europe. Hitler had become Chancellor in thirty three. The Luftwaffe had been officially unveiled shortly thereafter. So there was no kidding themselves to the fact that there was a rising power in, in continental Europe. It's terrifyingly clear to British High Command that Britain does not have the war machinery it needs to compete with Hitler. The British government urgently needs new aircraft. The emphasis in the beginning is on fighters, not bombers, and that's mainly because of cost. You can build four fighters for the price of a single bomber, but the British High Command know that they also need those bombers. A bomber needs to do a few things. It needs to fly a significant distance compared to most aircraft at the time. You had to start extending range, and you had to extend payload. You actually have to carry bombs. Those specs call for an aircraft that can match German bombers in delivering destruction. The Air Ministry issues specification P-13 slash 36 for a new bomber. The specification asked for a six crew aeroplane that could carry 8,000 pounds of bombs, fly at 275 miles an hour and at 15,000 feet. Uh, that was not going to be an easily achievable aim. Uh, building a bomber is a, is a vast task from an engineering standpoint. So they really are asking quite a lot of the aircraft. And they want to do it, and this is another thing, in a two-engine bomber. This is a really tall order, not least because as well that this, all of this has to be achievable using two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines, which are still in development at the time. But this is music to the ears of a struggling little aeroplane company called Avro. Avro was born out of one young man's dreams of flying. Avro is started by a man called Sir Edwin Elliot Verdin Rowe. A. V. Rowe. So that, of course, is where the name comes from. Together with his brother Humphrey, Edwin Rowe founds the A. V. Rowe Aircraft Company in a basement in Manchester in 1910. World War I provides it with just the lift it needs to get off the ground. and the military knows they're gonna need some new aircraft. So what they do is that they order up a whole series of aeroplanes and seaplanes from A.V. Rowe, 
and that is just keeping the Manchester factory absolutely humming. But after the end of the war, a slump in demand rings big changes at Avro. So after the First World War, military contracts were cancelled and it became the lean years. It became a very difficult time. Obviously, nobody needs a constant, constant supply of military aeroplanes anymore, and so money is really hard to come by, and eventually Avro is sold to Crossley Motors, who want the factory space to build cars, and in 1928, A.V. Rowe resigns from the company. A brand new management at Avro tries to build the business back up. It's a really ambitious move, but it's led by this really legendary lead designer at Avro, and he's a man called Roy Chadwick. Roy Chadwick has been at Avro almost from the start. By this stage, he and general manager Roy Dobson are now running the company. Roy Chadwick, I think, very fortunately, met AV in the very early days. And I think they hit it off straight away, if you like. They both had the same and similar ideas about how an aircraft should be designed, and they had the same enthusiasm for aviation at a time when many people thought that flying was against nature's needs and it shouldn't happen, and it was wrong for people to fly. Chadwick's a real character, frankly, but he's also a brilliant designer, and he learns his craft from Rowe himself, and he actually holds to Rowe's design ethos. AV's mantra was build it strong, build it light, and build it powerful, because the the horsepower of engines in, uh, in their day, you had to be as light as possible to be able to fly as high as you could. So when the P-13 tender comes around in 1936, Chadwick has to employ all his persuasive skills to get the contract for the new bomber. Chadwick was able to convince the Air Ministry, because of his previous history, that he could meet and more all the specifications in the contract. Once the Air Ministry gets on board, a new bomber is born. There's a tradition that bombers are named after town, so that's it. They are now actively pursuing building a Manchester bomber. The first prototype, Manchester L7246, rolls off the Avro lines and begins flight testing in July 1939. But things don't fly smoothly. The problem when the Manchester's tested is that the rudders don't provide enough control, the engine runs too hot, and the hydraulics are rubbish. Everything stems from issues with the vulture engines that they were being told they had to use. That you can have a brilliant airframe, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the right engine to power it. But despite its faults, Bomber Command and the Air Ministry stuck with this aeroplane because they desperately needed it. They had nothing else, effectively. They commissioned this thing anyway, and they order from Avro 200 of 1,200 Manchester bombers. But it just becomes increasingly obvious that they're not up to the task, and so um, the government orders them to cease production. But Roy Chadwick isn't having any of this. Chadwick realised pretty early on that the, uh, the engine issue with the um, Voltis wasn't going to be solved satisfactorily. He could see that that engine was going to ruin his aircraft if he couldn't get that changed. And what he does is adapt the Manchester and replaces the two dud Vulture engines with four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines instead, and it makes the world of difference. Chadwick proposes a new, updated version of the Manchester powered by these new engines. He calls it Type 683. As an engineer, he can look at the Manchester and say, actually, the airframe's fine. You can make the airframe bigger. So we can move from two mediocre engines to four excellent Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, and all of a sudden move from a medium bomber with flaws to a large bomber that can be very effective. Type 683 now gets an official name and the Lancaster bomber is born. After weeks of poor weather, on the 9th of January, 1941, Chadwick's four-engine bomber taxis out for her maiden flight. The first test flight, um, the poor guys flying it had tested the Manchester, which had nearly killed them, so they can't have been that enthusiastic about getting into a really similar aeroplane. 
They were only meant to be up in the air for not very long, but they were up there for much, much longer. And they did a low fly past and dipped the wings, and they just said how fantastic it was. The test pilot came back, and he was absolutely uh, cock a hoop with the performance of the aeroplane. And they were smiling, absolutely beaming, and they called it from a beast to a beauty. And in June of 1941, the Air Ministry issues a contract to Avro for almost 500 Lancasters. It's a huge order, but Avro is ready for it. Avro had a good uh, setup for building the aircraft. Uh, they had learned building techniques and experience from the Manchester, so they were hitting the ground running, as it were. When they went into production at, towards the end of 1941, and they were still building Lancasters at the end of the war. The Lancaster inspired extreme devotion, not just in its air crews, but in the ground crews that maintained it. As a full-scale replica airframe at the Avro Museum in Stockport, Cheshire, shows. My late father was a ground engineer on the original aircraft, S for Sugar, which is now at Hendon. He went on to restore that aircraft post-war, so consequently I grew up working on the aircraft with him and um, it had quite a big impact on me. So after my father passed away, some years after, I used my income to uh, create this airframe that you see behind you um, with the express purpose of enabling the general public to go on board, learn about the Lancaster. In my opinion, World War II could not have been one without the Lancaster. With the success of Chadwick's designs, Avro expands its production lines. The government gives Avro a grant of £1 million to build a new factory at Chatterton. Now, it's a really beautiful building, but you know even Chatterton isn't big enough, because what Britain needs are more and more planes, and of course, what does that mean? Avro needs more and more factories. So what Avro decides to do is to build their next plant at Yeadon in Yorkshire on the site of the Leeds Bradford Municipal Airport. It's actually going to be the largest factory under one roof in all of Europe. And Avro's going to need it because the Lancaster is about to show the German people what it means to start a total war. Avro's Yeadon plant opens in February 1941 Yeadon's an incredible factory. The floor space takes up about one and a half million feet. I mean, that is huge. There are thousands of people working at this plant. It's like a small town, but all under a roof. One of the people working there was Lillian Grundy, a young shop assistant who finds herself drafted into the factory. I was 16 when the war started. I worked at Old Toffee Factory at Whitefield. And a woman came one day and asked a lot of personal questions. About a month after, I was called up to go and see this. A.V. Rose, that be about early, 41, and I'd be 18. The war factory where Lillian worked was an impressive size. It presented a massive target for German bombers as the story of nearby Chatterton shows. As a factory manufacturing bomber aircraft, it's always going to be a target for the enemy. Um, and on Easter Monday, 1941, uh, German bomber aircraft find the factory and drop bombs. Thankfully, it's Easter Monday. The workers are off on their Easter holidays, so there's almost no one inside and there are no casualties But then it makes them think about how to protect the factory from any further attack. To protect the massive Yeadon factory, Avro needs to think outside the fuselage. General Manager Roy Dobson completely understands the vulnerability of the factory better than anyone else. And he knows that you know, just one bombing raid could cripple the entire plant and could stall production indefinitely. So he comes up with what we always call in Britain a cunning plan. What he does is to call in designers from the film industry. What they do is that they bank up earth at 45 degrees all the way around the walls to eliminate any shadows being cast from the walls. And 
do the roof up so that when you look at it from above as a German bomber, you see mock houses, farms, trees, everything. They even had artificial cows and they would move them on a daily basis. And they even tried to change it for the seasons so they would have leaves and so on and so forth. Absolutely astonishing and there are some wonderful photographs of that. Quite amazing. But even with the extra capacity at the factories, demand for Lancasters soon outstrips Avro's ability to produce them. 55,000 parts make up a Lancaster. So that is an enormous number of parts that have to come in from war factories all over the country. You then have to spend 70,000 man hours doing half a million individual processes to come up with a finished aeroplane. At the peak of Lancaster production, Avro employs 40,000 people. But actually, it's a lot more than that, because if you include all the subcontractors, it was estimated that you have more than a million people taking part in putting the Lancaster together. It is a great testament to the, the people from Avro in particular and all these other subcontractors and other factories that uh, during the height of the war, seven or eight a day were coming out of production. Lillian played her part in this process by making the ties that bound the front of the plane together. I was there on the machine and we made big screws. It was uh, hard work, 12 hours a night. The women was on all the makeups and lays, and the machine was, well, I would say, 50 times bigger than me. We wore a hat to put all your hair in, cos the drill going round would have scalped you. There were only your feet not moving. Everything else was moving, and your brain had to keep alert, cos the machine was going round and round and round with the job, and it would tear your fingers. So you had to watch all the time. When I first went, I had to tell my fingers a few times. Yes. yes. And the Lancasters are needed to open a new front in the war immediately. And then you have the person of Arthur Harris come into the equation, who takes over bomber command in, in 1942. Harris is a committed believer in city bombing that he really believes that Britain can, can drive Germany out of the war by laying waste to its cities. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet. Germany will make a most interesting initial experiment. When Harris is talking about attacking a German city, you will devastate everything about that city fly at night with masses of bombers. Don't worry about hitting individual small targets, just blanket an area. At the end of May 1942, Harris launches the first thousand bomber raid, designed to obliterate the rail links and factories in one of Germany's key industrial cities. The thousand bomber raid on Cologne is over in 90 minutes, but in that time, they managed to start 2,500 fires and destroy or damage 13,000 buildings. It's shocking and devastating to the people on the ground. The raid was intended to cripple the city's industry while protecting the bombers through sheer weight of numbers. The raid is a success in that they only lose 4% of the aircraft that left Britain to take part in it. So yes, it absolutely works. And yet, a month later, the city is beginning to get back to work so that the long-term impacts of the Cologne raid don't live up to the immediate hype of the moment when it's seen to be so devastating in such a turn. This is why many people today question Bomber Harris's methods, though some still support him. The Thousand Bomber raids were primarily to hit industrial areas. Yes, civilian areas unfortunately got hit, but it wasn't quite the same as the Blitz on London or somewhere like that. So actually, I think Bomber Harris has been slightly hard done by by some of the criticism, and I think that's unwinding now. I think that people realise that those raids hit and destabilised a lot of the industrial production which actually foreshortened the war. Without it, the war may have gone on longer than it did. 
but thousand bomber raids don't come cheap, and someone has to make the bombers to fly them. To fulfill the insatiable demand, Avro's war factories are working round the clock. During the war, the work regime was extremely, extremely tough. It was a 12-hour shift, it was 24-hour production. And it was freezing cold. The doors opened at the back of you for them to take the wings out, which the riveters did. They were up ladders, riveting, so it was noisy. Everywhere you went was noise, noise, noise. Don't forget we was doing a man's job. We only got ladies' pay. Despite working at full capacity, the Lancasters don't come in unlimited numbers. To keep up the pressure, British High Command needs to find a way of hitting German industry using fewer planes. What Bomber Command needs to do is come up with a more strategic way of doing things. So find a target that can be attacked by a much smaller force but will cause maximum devastation to the Nazi war effort. The river valley of the Ruhr is where many Nazi war factories are based. Destroying them would be a big step towards winning the war for the Allies. They are supplied by seven great dams, three of which are crucial targets. Because what the Ruhr factories are powered by is hydroelectricity, and that comes from these three great, huge dams. So, if these dams can be breached, not only will the factories grind to a halt, but they'll also flood the Ruhr, and they'll literally bog it down for months. The only problem is, where do you get something powerful enough to breach these really thick dams? 1942. British High Command wants to hit the industrial heart of Germany, the Ruhr Valley. To do that, they must take out the dams at the top of the valley. But they don't have the right tools to target them, yet. Even before the war, the British Air Ministry has long identified the Ruhr Valley as a, a key strategic target. You know, because we know that what wins wars are factories, and the factories of the Ruhr Valley are the key to Hitler's war-fighting ability. So you've got these three great big dams around the valley, and they're holding back these massive lakes, and they are providing huge amounts of hydroelectric power, and all that power is used for making steel. Therefore, instead of taking out all of the individual factories, if you take out the dams, not only will they have no power to work, but you can devastate the area with flooding as well. But the problem is, is these dams are 40 metres thick. That is seriously thick. They're going to withstand a few poxy bombs. So what the RAF calculate is that a direct hit with large bombs might just do the trick, and it needs pinpoint accuracy. The problem, where do you get that? One man is obsessed with the idea and will stop at nothing to achieve it. His name is Barnes Wallace. Barnes Wallace is what would have been known at the time as a boffin. He's, he's the assistant chief uh, a designer for Vickers and on the outbreak of war, he just comes up with idea after, after idea on how Britain could win the war using technology. He's absolutely ideal because he, he's not somebody that, that, that looks at things in a conventional way. Barnes Wallace and his team closely research the biggest weaknesses in the dam structures. The problem you've got with trying to breach a dam is it's designed to, in fact, resist thousands, millions of tonnes of pressure. And very importantly, very difficult to bomb because it's a very, very small thin target. And a bomb bursting in water isn't very effective. One solution would be a torpedo that works with ships. But a torpedo won't work because the Germans have already thought of that. It's obvious. Um, so what they've done is string a traditional torpedo net in front of the dam so that if you do try that, um, it will catch the torpedo and if it does go off, it'll be too far away from the dam to cause any damage. So his thought is that he knows that an explosive force in contact with the actual dam wall will produce an effect that will push out the masonry 
and very importantly allow the millions of tons of water to then exploit even the smallest crack or fissure. You don't have to blow it to bits, you would have to weaken it enough for all of that pressure to push the dam away. Wallace turns to his own interest in naval history and a friend's expertise in the sport of cricket for a solution. The idea is, um, and it's taken from uh, Nelson's captains, they used to fire a cannonball so that it skimmed off the water and would bounce. Um, and this is the principle, to get the bomb to land right next to the masonry to blow it sky high and breach the dam. But getting a bomb to bounce on water isn't easy. Early in the experiments with a bomb, Barnes Wallace discovered a problem. When it hit the water, it sank. But he happens to have a conversation with a colleague who was a member of a local cricket club. And he pointed out that if you impart a backspin on a cricket ball, it will bounce across the grass. The question was therefore, if you could get a backspin on the bomb, would it bounce across the water? If you spin it backwards, not only will it give it the momentum to get close to the wall, but it will stop it from then bouncing too far away from the wall before it explodes, so it's perfect. So he needs to transfer that concept from a tiny little cricket ball to a whopping great big bomb. In 1942, Wallace presents his idea to the government's scientific advisers and gets the green light to conduct aerial tests. Initial tests aren't necessarily great. They have some where the bomb breaks up on hitting the water. They have some where it just sinks like a stone. And then eventually, they manage to launch this bomb at exactly the right height, exactly the right time. He finally gets it right. Because on the 23rd of January, 1943, the bomb gets dropped at almost 300 miles an hour at an incredibly low altitude of just 42 feet. And it bounces 13 times and lands right on target. But to duplicate that in combat conditions is going to be a real challenge. They need to be able to release the bomb at a specific altitude. And since this would be a nighttime raid, they came up with a system of two lights directed down beneath the aircraft so that the crew simply looked down to where the two lights came together as one, and that was the correct altitude for release. But the particular nature of the bomb made transporting it difficult. One problem with delivering the bomb is that there's only one aircraft that can do it. All other aircraft available in the RAF are too small. To actually make the bomb rotate, what you have to do is put a device below the bomb bay, linked chains driven by a motor in the aircraft so that the bomb is rotating correctly at the correct speed. Only the Lancaster had the capacity to fit this device. The Lancaster has a great long bomb bay, so it can be adaptable to the longest and heaviest bomb. So it can carry a huge load and deliver a huge load. And it had one other unique feature which made it the perfect fit for the delivery mechanism. This is the uh, main spar, which goes from wingtip to wingtip and passes through the center of gravity of the aircraft. And it's um, speculation on my part, but I would imagine the bomb would have been uh, hung directly underneath the main spar because that would offer the greatest um, aircraft trim with which to carry the bomb safely. So for the bouncing bomb to fly, Barnes Wallace needs Avro on his side. So you have this key meeting on the 26th of February where Wallace meets Avro Lancaster's designer, Roy Chadwick. And he asks him directly, can you modify these Lancasters? Without a pause, Chadwick looks at him and says, you know what, I can do it. And all I need is Vickers to handle the attachment arms and the driving mechanisms to spin up the bombs, and then we can get it done. Tests of the new Lancasters and the new bomb reveal the magnitude of the task ahead. By the time it's ready to go, upkeep, the bouncing bomb, weighs 9,000 pounds. It needs to be spun up to 500 rotations per minute before it leaves the aircraft. 
and that's not all. In order to work properly, the bomb is going to be dropped over water at a height of precisely 60 feet from an aircraft travelling at precisely 232 miles an hour. Now, that's not a lot of wiggle room. You know, it's a really big arse from the air crews. And don't forget, they're not doing it over a nice peaceful lake. They're doing it while being fired upon by the Germans. To carry out this Herculean mission, the RAF taps its most famous pilot, Wing Commander Guy Gibson. Now, he may be young, uh, he's only in his early 20s, but he's very experienced and he's exactly what the RAF needs. And he's called in and he's asked to put together a squadron of the very best air crews in Britain. Gibson assembles his squadron in Lincolnshire and he has them training on low level flying in Lancaster. So first of all, they're going all about the country at 200 feet and then perilously down to 150 feet, which is not only exhilarating, but pretty terrifying as well, because there's no room for error. Right up to the last minute, the crews are kept in the dark about their real target. The ultimate test for the Lancaster comes in spring 1943. On the 16th of May 1943, 19 Lancasters take off in three waves for Operation Chastise. With the intention of destroying three dams in the Ruhr Valley. To do that, they take off from Scampton in Lincolnshire. And they head out over the North Sea. And they're obviously going right into Nazi Germany. For the raid to succeed, accurate navigation was key. We're in the... Navigator's crew station here, and that navigator would have been shrouded in darkness behind a curtain, and that's so that he could look at his maps with a, a light on internally in the aircraft, but no light was emitted because that could be easily spotted by night fighters coming up on the aircraft. The navigator used um, dead reckoning, so they were using map reading and uh, compass bearings. They'd have to fly at 200 feet right across the North Sea, basically below radar. But anything else that goes wrong, anyone makes a mistake, they're, they're gone quickly. OK, uh, where I'm stood, this is where the flight engineer's crew station is. When he was facing forward, he was looking after this half of the panel with which he was able to monitor flaps, oxygen, uh, brakes. That enabled the pilot the freedom to monitor his main instruments on what's known as the blind flying panel. And they're all the instruments that the pilot needs to fly the aircraft safely, uh, such as airspeed, altitude, um, his artificial horizon. And the pilot cannot be distracted because the approach to the dams is extremely treacherous. In one case, it's a steep, wooded valley. The approach is absolutely staggeringly dangerous. The Nazis, of course, know something might happen. They've got anti-aircraft guns ready to try and shoot down any aircraft coming in. To succeed, the Lancasters must fly absolutely straight into the teeth of enemy fire. As soon as the bombers arrive in the area of the dams, all of the anti-aircraft fire jumps into action. So what the pilots are faced with is a terrifying run. They have got to keep steady and keep true. They can't dodge or anything. They've got to fly straight through a gauntlet in order to reach the point where they need to drop their bombs. This is because the bomb aimer can only do his job if the plane is flying straight and level. The bomb aim would lay in the prone position here and essentially lean on his elbows to operate all of the equipment in this position. On the right of the bomb aimer's position, you'll see that there's an instrument panel there and the bomb aimer would essentially program all the information required to drop the bombs as accurately as possible into there and the bombing computer would perform the calculations. The aircraft could not peel off and uh, get out of the target area. Instead, it had to continue flying straight and level for a prescribed period of time, um, normally in excess of 30 seconds, and the bombing computer would tell the F-24 camera to take the photograph 
So at the exact moment that they burst, the uh, picture that's developed would show the bombs of this aircraft detonating. And you can only imagine the crew and the relief they felt when they could finally peel off and, and get out, out of that area. And it's Gibson himself, you know, real leader amongst men, and he's the one making the first run. Makes the first run, drops the bomb, and it fails to breach the dam. At this point, Gibson is um, concerned that the next attempt is going to be again distracted by German fire. So what he decides to do is run the gauntlet again and fly alongside in order to protect and divert some of the German fire away from the Lancaster attempting to drop the next bomb. I mean, that's seriously brave. You know, he's already flown into the jaws of death once, and now he's going to do it again. The third and fourth runs don't work either, and by this point, 617 Squadron are starting to think that these bombs just don't work. The Lancaster comes in just as the German gunners are running out of ammunition, drops its bomb, bounces, goes all the way up to the dam, sinks below the waterline, and then nothing happens. And then suddenly the dam simply collapses. The first one has gone. Upkeep has worked. At this point, a hundred yard breach opens up in the Moan Dam and water begins cascading down into the valley below. But Gibson knows the job is far from done. Two more dams have to be breached that night on the Eder and Sorper rivers. It takes four runs to breach the Eder Dam, but the Sorper proves an impossible nut to crack. The third dam, the Sorper Dam, is different and was always doubtful. It's an earthen structure, and it's always been a concern that the bomb was not powerful enough to um, breach it. It takes something like 10 passes to even get a target lock on it, but even then, it's unsuccessful and the dam isn't breached. But two dams have been breached, and millions of gallons of water are now roaring down the Roar Valley as planned. Basically, the raid is a huge success. You know, the floods are washing away roads and railways and bridges. Mines are flooded, 11 factories completely destroyed, more than 100 others damaged. And you just got, you know, a huge devastating impact on steel production in the Ruhr. And uh, that's dropped down to a quarter of the level of what it was before the raid. By far the greatest impact of the raid is the loss of hydroelectric power. You have two power stations wiped out. And the Germans admit that it hurts them. I mean, Albert Speer, the armaments minister, later admits that if the Sorper dam had been breached, it would have been a complete disaster. But that even with just two dams down, the raid was a disaster for us for many months. Those months would cover a critical turning point in the war when the Nazis desperately needed to replenish their forces. But while the dam busters grabbed the headlines, Britain's stalwart Lancasters would continue relentlessly with the unglamorous job of pounding Germany's industry to rubble. The German economy goes into a tailspin because now strategic bombing is beginning to shut down the German economy through transportation and fuel. So if you add all those together, it plays an extremely important part in winning the Second World War. All of this together in aggregate produces a rapid unraveling of German industrial capability. They can't produce the factories because they're being bombed on a regular basis. And more and more rolling stock is being destroyed. It's irreplaceable. Hitler's armaments minister finally has to admit defeat. In January 1945, Albert Speer ran the numbers on what the bombing campaign had done to his factory schedules in 1944. He reckoned that Germany had produced 35% fewer tanks, 31% fewer planes and 42% fewer lorries due to bombing than it should have done that year. To him, it's the transportation attacks. It's the attack on the railways and, and uh, the ability to move coal, you know, to fire the, the power plants and to move things around the good. He believes this is devastating and in the sense he's right. It's Speer who comes to Hitler at the end of January 45 and he says to him, the war is over in the area of heavy industry and armaments. We're done. We can no longer fight. Now, that's a kind of 
crippling admission. Uh, you know, this is a man who boasted that he could increase German industrial production threefold. Basically, the bombers, led by the Lancaster, have utterly defeated him. The Lancaster bombers get one last chance to strike at Hitler, just five days before the Nazi Führer takes his own life. So, on the 25th of April 45, you've got another great Lancaster headline grabbing raid, and they head for the Obersalzburg, which is Hitler's mountain retreat. Now, you know, some people suggest that the reason for this attack is simply to show the Germans once and for all that they're absolutely trounced. It's clearly a great propaganda victory. Look, it's all gone. Hitler's country retreat, dead. With Hitler defeated and the war over, Avro's massive factories must now find new markets. Similar to the First World War, Avro, after the Second World War, still had, um, you know, a reduction in orders. Um, contracts were, were, were stopped. And so they had to look for commercial flight and passenger flight. But it does take time to get into passenger aircraft. There's no doubt about it. But not long after the war, um, you know, the Cold War, really gave another boost to the Avro, the Avro story, if you like, because the Vulcan was being developed. Yes, the war factory attitude held them in good stead. Avro's post-war jet bomber was the Avro Vulcan, which relied a lot on the lessons that Avro had learned during World War II with the Lancaster. You think the Lancaster has a big bomb bay, you don't realise what big is until you stand underneath a Vulcan and see the size of the bomb bay in that aeroplane. So you've gone to an air-pressured, nuclear-carrying, delta-wing um, aircraft that could fly at 57,000 feet. And all that in less than 50 years from AV's first flight in 1909. And that is a testament to Roy Chadwick, but Roy, unfortunately, never saw the fruition of it. Um, he was killed in 1947 in a crash just 300 yards from here. In 1963, the Avro name disappears as the company was absorbed into Hawker Sidley Aviation. But the memory of its vital contribution to the war lives on. You only have to look at the statistics of the Lancaster to realise that it was the a kind of symbol of how brilliant British war factories had been. And actually, you know, without the help of the trusty Lancaster, of course, Hitler's war factories would never have been destroyed. This educational airframe is a tribute to 55,573 volunteer airmen that were lost flying on Bomber Command. World War II indeed could not have been won without the efforts of uh, Lancaster's serving on Bomber Command, which really sums up the reason why Bomber Harris called it his shining sword. People always celebrate the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but let's not forget the Lancaster is surely just as iconic and actually, in a way, was more of a war winner than those other two planes.